Yeah. Yep. Okay, so <clears throat> welcome to the lecture in SBOOC. I just said I'm going to go back in my history because I've not been working on um, docking for a while, but I can still tell you about the principles. Um, so, <clears throat> what this is going to be about is um, the general idea that we're going to explore in this whole lecture is that similar proteins have similar interaction partners, and what can you do about this and how can you use this? Um, the first thing to say is, well, this is a known paradigm in truck discovery and sort of function prediction, etc. But we have to treat it with some. Right. Okay. <laughs> uh, so. <clears throat> Most people believe that similar proteins have similar interaction partners, but you have to be a bit careful about that. It's not always true. But it's a general, a good idea, and using that, you can, for example, if you have a protein and you want to find a drug for it, you can look at similar proteins and see what binds to them, and then you have a good starting point. <coughs> okay. So yeah, what's, what, what do we need this paradigm for? One thing is function prediction, and I think this is also something that comes in this lecture. Uh, another thing is drug development, <coughs> where people are now exploring target classes. So they don't just take one protein from a certain family of proteins, but they um, take a number of them, and then when they make some compounds that might be able to bind against one of them, they can also test it against the other. So you have some kind of... Um, leveraging the, the cost you have anyway. And another thing is you can try and predict side effects. He, so... He, he thought that he was in a serum. <laughs> he didn't realize that he, he belonged here. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Wrong person today, right? Um, <laughs> So the other idea you can use this for um, is to predict side effects. Because if you have similar proteins and they do bind similar things, then of course another protein that is similar and which you don't want to target might still bind the drug and this can cause another effect when you didn't want to, to have. So it's also worthwhile keeping this in mind when you try to develop a drug, but you also need to look at the similar proteins and make sure that if possible, they don't bind, or at least don't bind that well. So this is the general idea why I put this in the center. Um, another idea that is pretty, pretty new in um, drug discovery is, well, rather than thinking about the, the negative things like they have side effects, the drugs, can we also use this as something positive? If a drug binds to more than one protein, maybe instead of just targeting one thing in the whole network of um, pathways, etc., that we have, we, we try to, to target the entire network and then to regulate the, the effect of some proteins, the, the effect of something happening by, for example, blocking several things that come after each other in, in a network. Because often if you have several things happening on one molecule, they all need to, the, the different proteins all need to bind something that is in, in principle similar. So the binding pockets are going to be in principle similar, so maybe you can block several parts of this. But, but this is a very new paradigm, and traditionally, um, if you want to get a drug approved, you have to more or less prove that it only binds to one thing. <coughs> okay. So, um, if we want to use this whole idea of looking at binding sites and trying to predict what they, what a protein might do, um, the first thing what we have to do is to find where's the binding site. I mean, now we're, we're not looking at, we're focusing, so I'm not talking about the case where you have a chemist who's focusing on one protein and, and only looking at that, but now we're looking at, okay, you've got a whole set of things and you want to find something in a big database. And then, we have to find out how do we how do we find binding sites in the first place? We want the computer to be able to do it. The chemist, of course, can take a structure and look at it, and then he can say, okay, well, probably there's the cavity and it can interact like that. But how do we do it with a computer? That's what I'm going to show you in this lecture. And the other thing is, how do we predict a ligand? That's the docking part, which I'm going to talk about later. Okay, so 
how do proteins interact with small molecules? And yeah, uh, one thing I have to say, there is one thing of protein-protein interactions, and we've got separate lectures about this. The stuff I'm talking about is a protein interacting with a small molecule, something that can bind into some kind of binding pocket. Okay? Okay, so in order to uh, explain how proteins interact with uh, small molecules, I'm going to recap a bit on protein structure. I think that never hurts. Um, I'm going to tell you a bit about um, what a binding site is. I'm going to do a bit physical chemistry so you understand how we try to predict stuff. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about how you analyze binding sites and how you do docking. Um, and this is an example of what, how we visualize binding sites. So all these dots would be the positions where you have atoms sitting um, and um, the atoms of course also have an electron hull and the electron hulls can, um, I mean they can't approach infinitely, um, but they, they repel each other and therefore in order to have an idea of okay how does this thing look to for example a small molecule, we, we draw these um, surfaces so we get an idea of how do things fit into each other. I'll talk a bit more about that later. Okay, some recap of protein structure. I guess you learned that in one of the first lectures. Um, proteins are made up of amino acids. The amino acids are made up of loads of um, different atoms. Um, they fold up into secondary structure elements. The secondary structure elements fold up into tertiary structure. And often you've got several chains interacting with each other and that makes the um, quaternary structure. What we're interested in, in the end, is the folded protein and finding where's the cavity where a compound could bind. And um, it's worthwhile when you try to think about how can a compound interact with a protein, you need to think about, okay, what, what kind of interaction partners do I have in the protein? Therefore, it's useful to have a general idea, okay, what kind of amino acids do I have available? Um, you can broadly classify them into um, what do we have here? <coughs> into the more bulky ones or, or um, the, the uncharged ones. And among the uncharged ones, you've got smaller and more bulky ones. But those, those make basically no directional interactions and no very strong interactions because they're just uncharged. They're just electron hulls that can interact a little, but not very much. Then you've got um, this other group here where you've got lots of NH and OH groups um, and these can make uh, hydrogen bonds. I'll come back to what a hydrogen bond is in a bit more detail later. And the other thing is the charged amino acids and those can of course have Coulomb interactions where charges um, uh, repel or attract each other. So this is the kind of thing you can look for and this is also the kind of interaction you can try to design into a ligand if you want it to bind to a, a protein. <coughs> okay, so uh, this is just to il illustrate that one um, binding site can bind a pretty diverse set of ligands. So depending on where this thing attaches and, and what kind of interaction it finds. Usually binding sites are, um, are less undefined, so this is a pretty big one. Okay, and when chemists try to look at binding sites, I, I, I first showed you the, the 3D thing, um, but we also often try to, to make it easier and then projecting it into 2D can be easier to highlight interactions because here you can better draw like, okay, I've got a, um, something that might be a hydrogen bond here or here, etc. And a nice way of looking at this um, is with the lick plot program. And if you want to look at PDB structures and how they interact with ligands, I can really recommend using lick plot because um, it, it gives you, it annotates the structure for you. Okay, <laughs> so I'm talking about binding sites. Binding site is um, a word that's used a lot, but different people might mean different things with it, just to make you aware of that. 
So one thing to, to define the word binding site is that it, it has a function um, and it could mean binding to other proteins, which again is outside this lecture, but in principle binding site doesn't tell you what is meant with the word. Um, it could mean binding to substrates, so an enzyme, would. Is, do you all know what an enzyme is? Who can say it? <laughs> right, catalyzer chemical reaction, and the things that it works on are the substrates. So <clears throat> it can be um, a binding site can be the place where you bind a substrate. It could also be the place where you bind a cofactor. Um, we are mostly interested in, in the binding sites for substrates because most of the time when we do drugs we want to block a reaction for example. So we want to replace the substrate with something else. <coughs> but of course when you're talking about binding sites um, you can also talk about the cofactors and if you want to find the function of something and you don't know that it's bound to something it can also help you to find out that there's usually something bound there which is needed and then you have an idea of what this protein is used for. <coughs> Another thing that defines a binding site is the form. Usually it's a cavity in the protein and it sounds pretty obvious but it's also worthwhile to think about why. I mean why is a, a, a binding site usually a cavity and not just something on the surface of the protein? To maximize the surface. Right, you have a bigger surface of interaction between the ligand and the, and the protein, right? Uh, and there's another reason. The axis can be more restricted in the cavity. On the surface, I can, a lot of uh, binding particles can interact with the cavity. Yeah, right. It has to be kind of oh. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> um, Right, so, uh, and for enzyme reactions, that is actually also something pretty important that you can, that you have like a secluded space and something can happen there and you can keep other stuff out that would interfere. And the final thing is, I mean, you, you trap the thing there. So if you want, for example, a reaction to happen and you want to bind one thing to another thing and you have it in a cavity, then it can't move away so easily, so you've trapped it there. So. <coughs> Okay, and now if we're talking about we want to find the binding sites um, in a computer, we also have a pragmatic way of uh, defining what a binding site is. Um, we look at a, a PDB, so you all know PDB files? Worked with them? Okay, so when we record the structure, we, we, we make a database entry for um, uh, the structure of a protein. What we have is a so-called PDB file. This is the uh, protein database which collects all the uh, protein structures. Um, and they make a distinction between natural amino acids, which they have in atom records, and things that are not naturally occurring in a protein, and that's in HAT atom heteroatom records and now if you look for all the heteroatom records in, the, in such a file and you look at the area around it you usually have the binding site. <coughs> okay so I said that um, a binding site is usually a pocket or a cleft in the protein and we just talked about why this makes sense. Um, it's also usually less hydrophobic than the interior of a protein. Do you all have an idea why the interior of a protein is hydrophobic in the first place? So, uh, yeah? I think maybe if it was hydro, uh, so the opposite, uh, the protein would blow up because it would uh, allow um, water molecules to go inside and it would just, yeah. Yeah, right. So the hydrophobic interactions and keeping water out is one of the big things that keeps the protein together. But then again, if I have a binding site, then this needs to interact with water, so it needs to be less hydrophobic. Um, Okay, so, and the binding site, of course, is usually specific because it needs to be complementary to the thing it binds in form and uh, electrostatic interactions um, and hydrogen bond, bonds, etc. <coughs> um, 
Okay, so now we assume that we have this database of um, protein structures and we automatically want to find them. What can we do? <coughs> so one thing is we can look at just the geometry and try to find the largest pocket. And there are loads of methods of doing that. I now more or less um, arbitrarily pick one to, to show you <coughs> to just get this uh, general idea um, and to make it a bit less arbitrary, I pick the oldest one. <coughs> um, okay, let's first say about the why is finding um, a, this thing geometrically sensible. Well, if you go through all the data and you have manually annotated um, binding sites, um, you can look. Um, it's the, the hypothesis that usually um, the, the interesting binding site is the largest pocket. Is that true? And um, Roman Lakowski, for example, did that for um, active sites of, of um, enzymes, and he found that indeed in 83%, the largest pocket was the one where the reaction happened, etc. So it's a pretty good guess. Um, Okay, so how does Pocket do it? That's the, the oldest problem which I wanted to show you. Well, what you do is you take the protein and you just put it into a Cartesian um, coordinate space and um, then you can mark the points in this um, grid as being close to some atom or being more than three um, axioms away from an atom. So you just go through all the points in your grid and you see, do I find an atom in the vicinity? Um, if I find an atom, it's inside. If I don't find an atom, I label the point as outside. Okay. Um, now I go, so now what is special about the, the uh, binding site? What makes, so, I mean, binding site is, Obviously, something that's outside or solvent. Um, but what makes the, the points in the, in the binding site different from any other point in the solvent? Well, the points in the binding site are surrounded by protein in a way. So you can now go move along the axis and see, do I find any points which lie between Protein, between two things marked as protein on the same axis. And now I mark all those. And I can also do this in, in the three different directions and see how often do I find this. The more often I find it, the more buried it is or in the more direction this thing is buried. Okay, and then I can just find the largest cluster of things that I have marked as a pocket and I'll find, find the binding site. Um, yeah, this, uh, I also wanted to show you the, the one improvement on that because it's a, a nice way illustrating how people, you know, once you've invented a method, people start thinking, okay, how can I improve that? Um, and so Manfred Handley based this thing on uh, pockets and invented things, uh, something called Lickside. Um, and one thing he did is um, he just implemented a more efficient algorithm for searching neighbor atoms because in pocket that was really stupid and there he managed to, to handle the, the data structure in a more efficient way. But the other thing is he also wanted to, to uh, be able to find um, the pockets more sensitively. Um, and if you, so in the pocket thing, it depended a lot on how you embedded the protein into the Cartesian space. And there he said, well, you know, you could also have more um, directions in which I look. And therefore, um, he added the cubic diagonals. And the other thing is, um, pocket was really old, so at the time they did it, um, computer power, power was really low, and also the, the um, memory you had. And now when Manfred did Lickside, um, he had more powerful computers, so he decreased the grid size. And then of course you can get um, more sensitive. And because you now have more directions we're looking, you also have a more um, sensitive way of looking at how buried is something. Okay, 
And um, this then was, I mean, you can, if you look in the paper, then he can claim that he's a bit more um, efficient in, in finding the pockets. <coughs> okay, so one method to look for pockets automatically would be to look at the geometry. The other idea would be to say, okay, these things have to interact with a small molecule. So I look for points in the protein which would be able to interact with the protein. So now I need to start and look at the energy and, and to calculate interactions. Looking at geometry is pretty simple. I just have to have the, the coordinates. Looking at interactions is a bit more difficult because I need to understand the physics and the physical chemistry. Okay. Okay, so the, the idea is the binding site interacts with the molecule, so I find the, to need to find some interaction points. Now we need to go and look at what are typical ways proteins interact with something else. Um, there's probably stuff you all saw in chemistry, physical chemistry, wherever before, but it might have been a while back. Um, so one of the things chemists like a lot is um, hydrogen bonds um, and what you need to think about when you want to use hydrogen bonds and, and optimize structures such that hydrogen bonds work is that you need to think about what's the direction a hydrogen bond would occur in. Because you know when you want to design a ligand to, to interact with something and you put in a group somewhere where it doesn't have a chance to really interact properly with a protein, it doesn't help you. Therefore it's worthwhile thinking about, okay, what is the actual geometry of a hydrogen bond? And um, therefore we look at the, the um, at for example a water molecule and we see that there are two lone electron pairs um, in an axis to the H groups and that is the direction in which a hydrogen bond would occur in. Um, and what happens is that you've got these, these lone electron or these electron pairs that are kind of left over. You've got some uh, negative charge here and you've got the hydrogen over there which doesn't get all the electrons it would like to get so it's a bit positively charged and those two can interact and share some of that electron density. So that's what a uh, hydrogen bond is in the end. Um, other interactions we typically find are so-called ionic interactions or salt bridges. Um, salt bridge is just another name and I, you don't really need to know loads about it. It just do not confuse you when somebody says salt bridge. What is meant is an ionic interaction. Um, and an example would be <coughs> that you um, have an acid, an acidic um, amino acid um, and a basic amino acid. So the acid would be deprotonized, so it has a negative charge. The um, base would be protonized, so it has positive charge and those two can interact. Usually we say that um, ionic interactions are pretty strong. There would, for example, it keeps crystals together like uh, your common salt or something. Um, however, you have to see that in uh, proteins occur in water solution. So any charge would be surrounded by loads of water and that makes the interactions a lot less um, strong because the water is a dipole and it kind of shields the, the charges after pretty short distances already. But on the other hand, if you have a charged group in a protein, or even worse, if you have a charged group in a ligand, and you bury it in, a, in an environment where it can't interact with anything, that is definitely not good for your interaction. So this is to say, if you have two charges, it doesn't help you a lot, it doesn't make the interaction a lot stronger, but if there's a charge there, you need to account for it somehow. Um, okay, another kind of interaction is that you can have metals um, in, in a protein and this often occurs in some cofactors um, and it, it's very common if you have some, some things that, um, occur, uh, that happen on the electron level. So if you have a reduction, reduction means um, a compound gets more electrons. <laughs> or you have an oxidation, that means it gets the electrons taken away from it, then very often a metal is involved because that helps um, lower the um, activation energy. And another kind of interaction is that you can have a cation and you have um, 
an electron, you have delocalized electrons in, in a so-called pi um, group, um, and this can also interact. Again, you have a charge and it can interact with loads of electrons running around. Okay, so now if you want to, to model um, the, these interactions and calculate them, we need to think about the physics. Um, the physics for charges is described by the Coulomb potential. Hey. <coughs> um, the physics for two non charged groups to just electron shells is a bit more complicated because you've got the attraction between the electron shells um, because when uh, the charge is distributed a bit um, oddly in one shell this makes a very little dipole and then again in the other shell this can induce a dipole and then these two can attract each other. Um, on the other hand if the um, nuclei come too close they repulse each other if the electron shells in general come too close to each other you get a repulsion and therefore in some you've got this kind of curve so there's always a minimum where the, the two molecules would attract each other a bit and it's good if they come that close and then if they come closer you've got a big repulsion and if you try to model this then of course you have to make sure that your atoms don't come too close and it gets unrealistic. Okay so this term is very common in uh, programs that try to predict the um, interactions, Leonard Jones potential. Um, why is this all relevant? Well, the energy of an interaction is related to the strength of binding. Um, so if we want to predict a ligand that binds strongly to a protein, we have to find a ligand that would have a big interaction energy. Um, so what we look at in chemistry usually is this reaction, a protein and a ligand bind and form a complex and um, what you also learn pretty uh, soon when you study chemistry is that it's wrong to just make the arrow in one direction, it always also goes in the other direction, only the question is where does the equilibrium lie, so where is more of that? And you can describe that by looking at the concentrations, how much concentration do you have of free ligand and a free protein and how much concentration do you have of the complex. <coughs> and um, the smaller this thing is, the more um, concentration you have of the complex and therefore we're always looking for a small binding constant. So if we have a strong uh, binder, then we want to have a small binding constant. That's also something that people you talk about drug design, etc. talk a lot. And the other thing you discover is that there's a relationship between this binding constant and the energy of the reaction. Um, and this is how it's related. So when we predict an energy that uh, an uh, energy difference that is high, then that means that the binding constant is also um, <coughs> very extreme low for example in that case. Uh, I won't go into that one. Okay now I said there are ways to, to calculate the energy and um, now if you want to find um, a binding site then we can um, again one of the oldest tools to do that was called grid because again they took a grid around the protein and looked at loads of positions in the grid and calculated all the stuff I showed you before. How much would be the electrostatic interaction, how much would be um, like the, the Van der Waals interactions, the Leonard Jones potential. They would calculate all that together and then they would mark the grid point with an energy if you have a an atom here, then the interaction of that atom with all the protein around that would be that much. And this is what they call probe molecules, so they would look at different properties this atom or this, this molecule that is sitting at the uh, grid point could have, um, but very often they just take one probe. So they just take, for example, a methyl probe, so a C with um, four H's and just look at that, or they just look at an OH or something like that. Okay. Um, yeah, so 
these are the terms that are used in, in GRID, Leonard Jones, electrostatic, and a hydrogen, hydrogen bond. Um, and then what you get <coughs> is this would be the, the, how the pocket looks naturally. Um, and then if you look at where can I put my probes, then you get clusters where a probe would be um, uh, beneficial and you can say, okay, these are the points where I would have good interactions and then I can try and cluster these somehow to find out um, what is the pocket. Um, grid itself uh, was very crude. Again, it was um, pretty old um, and it was basically used for, for visual binding site characterization. But then something like uh, QFinder uh, would be a tool implemented on top of GRID and that would do that um, programmatically. Um, and they clustered adjacent GRID points which met some energy criterion. And so this illustrates how the ligand in that pocket bounds really and what pocket was um, predicted to be inside the binding site. And what they found was that for 70% um, um, the binding site they predicted was the real binding site and in 90% the real binding site was among the first three. So the only difference is the different sampling or grid points? Well, different, yeah. So you mean difference to geometric methods, yeah. To grid. To, well, I mean, grid itself wasn't really made for that. Grid was more for, you know, visual inspection and, and um, Q-Side Finder is based on grid and then really for um, finding pockets. Um, and again, the, the, the criterion for finding pockets, how do you define the pocket? Well, I mean, you know, you, you have an, uh, a set of proteins and you define the overlap of the, um, I mean, you know where ligand binds. And then in that case, for example, they take, they say, I look at the overlap between the area used by the ligand and the area predicted to be a binding site. Again, the question is, how do you predict? Well, they predicted, so they calculated the, um, the energies, then they clustered the points with um, a certain uh, energy threshold. Um, and then they, they, they had some way of, of extending the cluster a bit so to make it a bit smoother. Um, and then they look at, okay, my cluster points, how much do they overlap with the ligand volume? And the av uh, average precision they got for that one was almost 70% overlap. Um, okay. <coughs> how, are we, how are we for time? Um, okay. I think we can close the yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Just a bit. Give a few more minutes. Okay, fine. Oh, no, 40. <laughs> um, okay, so when I. Let's assume I've run my program and now I want to know something about this binding site. So I, I, I now have extracted loads of binding sites from the PDB and now I want to find out the properties of the binding sites. What do I look at? Again, I need to always look at the stuff. How can this thing interact with um, my uh, ligands or something? For example, if I want to find the, the, the function, I need to find what could it interact with. So I need to look at the geometry. I could look at the amino acid composition of the binding site. This also gives, says, tells me something about the possible interactions. Um, I can look at um, how does it interact with solvent? Is it hydrophobic? Um, and where are the charges in the binding site? Um, and these are things I can do with a computer or I can also do visually. And often if we want to find out something about a specific protein, we also, also look at it. Um, and one thing we often do is to map um, hydrophobicity. <coughs> do you all know what hydrophobicity is? Sorry? Is it a real uh, hydrophobic part of the Yeah, right. How would you measure that, by the way? How, how, can, I, how can I map hydrophobicity to something? Uh, I think it depends uh, on the... You try to put more and more and you, you follow where it's going to. So if you have like a tracer, like columns or something, and you go where it's going. But uh, I okay. think it's too, the protein is too small to 
Yeah. And now in that case, we 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 calculate something where we map a value to certain groups. <coughs> but so what we do is um, we look at certain groups of um, or uh, different compounds. Then we look at how do they distribute between uh, a hydrophobic um, phase and water. And in this ca case, we often use octanol. And we just measure how much of that compound do we get in octanol and how much do we get in water. <clears throat> and we do that for loads of um, small molecules. And then we look at, OK, what functional groups are there. We have an OH group, we have a CH3 group, we have whatever. And then we kind of do um, an analysis trying to, to um, uh, make a model of how much of this overall part, um, partition uh, coefficient between octanol and water can be attributed to the different groups. And then um, we get a value for every different functional group. And once we have the value for the functional groups, we can go through a protein and then put on the labels for this is that hydrophobic or this has this contribution to hydrophobicity and then we just um, paint um, the surface with that value. Just to get, give you an idea of that, this is, I mean, this is of course, um, um, all based on measurement, but in another way, I also wanted to give you the idea that this mapping lipophilicity or hydrophobicity is not, there's not the truth in that. It's more an estimate. Okay. Um, another way of, of mapping hydrophobicity would go, uh, be going in um, with these probes I described for grid, for example, and try to um, calculate interaction energies. Um, that's a different approach to that. So the one comes completely from experiment and then trying to map this experiment to, to parameters, and the other one um, comes trying to come from first principles. Um, another thing we, we look at often is mapping electrostatics to the surface. So we want to, to know which areas of the protein would be very positively charged or negatively charged. If, you look, if we look at that, then it, makes us hel it helps us find, okay, we can put something positively charged inside a negatively charged pocket. Um, but again, what I wanted to, to make you understand is that mapping electrostatics is not that trivial either because in order to find out where is this thing positively or negatively charged we need to work out um, where are the protons still attached to the acids and where do they dissociate and also where do the proteins really go to the bases and where do they dissociate and in order to predict that <laughs> That depends on the electrostatic environment. So we kind of have a circle here. So uh, the more charged the environment already is, the less likely is the protein to, to go away, for example, uh, the proton to go away from an acid if there already is um, negative charge. So all this mapping of electrostatics on a protein is again not like the truth. But if you want to compare two proteins and two pockets, then it helps a lot to take the same program to map electrostatics on both proteins, because then at least you're pretty sure you're going to get the trends right. <clears throat> and I, I'm not saying that this is all rubbish, it's just to make you to make sure that you understand that this is not absolutely reliable. Okay, um, when we want to characterize the, the um, binding pocket, another thing that chemists like to do is to rely on knowledge they have from other places. Like I told you about the lipophilicity, what we do is to, we measure loads of things and then we try to, to map it to the different functional groups. And here also the idea is rather than trying, starting from first principles and looking at the physics and trying to calculate interactions, we look at what do we have, what can we observe? And things we can observe, for example, um, are we have loads of data of small molecule crystals. 
Um, so whenever somebody makes a compound, often it gets crystallized and it gets structurally determined. And that is um, also uh, collected in a database um, in the CSD. And they do loads of things for analyzing all these organic compounds. <coughs> And um, they had the idea, well, we've got lots of information about what's, what interactions are, are favorable. If I have a, for example, CO group here, where would it be likely to find an OH group and what exact geometry, etc.? We could use that for proteins too. Um, so what they do is to, to cut the protein apart into functional groups and then map on the favorite interaction geometries onto the protein. And they transfer the knowledge from the organic chemistry database onto the protein database, kind of. And that program is called Superstar. And it's, um, at least at the time I did the drug design, it was um, used quite a lot in order to generate ideas. Especially if you, if you already have a compound that's sitting in somewhere, and now you want to, to improve it, um, then you can, can use Superstar to map the area and get ideas for, oh, maybe I could have another interaction there, this area is not filled, and I could try and extend my molecule a little, and then it could make that interaction. <clears throat> okay, now we have looked at what interactions do we have, how can we find binding sites, um, and how can we characterize them if we just want to look at them. Now it's the question, how can we compare them? For example, if you want to, to find other proteins that might interact with, this, with a similar ligand, etc., it would be good to be able to search through the whole database and find exactly those proteins that have a similar binding site. Um, in order to do that, what do we need to do? Well, one thing is we need to be able to somehow superimpose the 3D structures. If we have two 3D structures of proteins and we want to compare them, we have to find how they fit onto each other, which, which residues are equivalent. Um, and another thing is, once we have this alignment, then we need to analyze what is similar and what is different about them. And we can go through different kinds of things. We can just look at the amino acid composition. That's easy because it's just 20 amino acids and it's um, comparatively easy to compare. Um, we can look at local conformations. We can look at the pocket size. Um, and we can look at where are interaction partners. If we want to look at where are sites for interaction partners, that gets more difficult because then we need to make more hypotheses of where could this thing sit. And aligning two proteins and uh, finding this uh, structural superimpositioning is again rather easy if the sequences are similar because then at least we know which residues should be uh, close to each other when we superimpose them. Um, and it's also fairly straightforward if at least the structures are similar, so the overall arrangement of secondary structure or something, if that is similar, then we can pretty well work out how these fit together. The really interesting part, which um, the group where I worked and loved, was cases where the binding site is similar and binds to a similar compound without anything happening. That's the real challenge. Because, I mean, sometimes you have this, it's, it's like convergent evolution. Um, you, you want to, to solve the same problem twice and you develop completely different proteins. And that's really interesting to find. But you can solve a lot of problems already by just looking for which sequences are similar and which structures are similar. <coughs> Okay, for um, comparing binding sites, if you ever need to do that, um, there is a program called ReadyBase, which does a lot of the analysis for you. So you can, can, can say, okay, this is the protein I'm interested in, please find me uh, proteins that are sequenced similar, superimpose them, and then for this set of proteins, please show me which residues change, um, and yeah, where, where it might be something bigger or smaller or whatever. Um, so this is a, a useful tool for, for chemists to really work with them. And it stores the, the binding sites from the PDB structures, does the superpositioning, and yeah, computes the differences. Um, yeah, and as I said, the, the really interesting thing is when two things 
are not similar sequence based or structure based um, but still bind the same thing and I'm going to talk a bit more about that but maybe make five minutes problem. how do we find proteins that are not obviously similar and here we have an example of two things um, uh, you probably don't see at first sight that this, the, the ligands are similar but actually that part of the ligand um, occurs in both molecules and it can help you to already find a similarity like that um, when you try to look at the interactions of the two compounds with their proteins at first sight they look completely different um, when you take out the, the pieces that are similar in both uh, compounds um, you start to find that the interactions are also um, similar for example this N interacts with the um, carbonyl group um, and you have the same kind of interaction here um, this nitrogen has an interaction with another nitrogen um, and you have the same kind of interaction there so if you really look at the details you start to see that the kinds of the, the way the two proteins have solved the problem of interacting with that thing are pretty similar. And that's the challenge we want to find. <coughs> um, so what we need to do is first find the binding site, then capture the important features, and then search efficiently against loads of structures, because in the end we want to search through the whole protein structure database. Um, and when we search we need to find the best way of superimposing and we need to find a good way of scoring um, working out whether this this comparison is be better than that other comparison <coughs> um, in the original slide set I was showing two methods now I've cut it down to one um, the yeah the way this is done in general is that um, you can represent the, the two proteins um, with physical, chemical or evolutionary pro uh, properties. That means you can take the atoms or chemical groups or surface points um, and you can map onto them. Are they charged? Are they a hydrogen bond donor? Are they a hydrogen bond acceptor? Um, are, yeah, things like that. Are they hydrophobic? Um, and but you can also look at evolution maybe these things are very conserved then they're probably important for something or you have a conser conservation of a certain type of an amino acid then that means also something for the interactions it probably makes um, another thing would be to have a general kind of shape descriptor but I'm not going to go into that and then if you superimpose um, there is different methods that are used. One is geometric caching and the other thing is graph theory and clique search and that's something that occurs very often in docking and in protein structure superimpositioning and that's why I'm going to focus on that one. So it's kind of a reoccurring theme. Um, and in the end <coughs> if you want to measure the similarity of the interaction points or whatever you have found you can just look at how distant are they. This is what you do within RMSD. Um, you can look at residue conservation that is this um, corresponding to this evolutionary thing or you can look at how similar are the, the physical chemical properties, how similar are the charges etc. Okay so <coughs> CASBase uh, was developed in the group where I did my PhD and um, what we did there or my colleague did there um, was he based it on Lickside where he already had the um, uh, the extraction of the binding sites which I showed you before um, and then he looked at um, the residues around the cavity and he um, represented the amino acids not just by for example the C alpha do you know where the C alpha is in an amino acid? okay you have to sir it's a carbon alpha. Uh, right. Is, uh, you should you, you should um, interrupt people who are talking to you and um, <laughs> uh, thinking you know things because we are, we we're so used to talking about this that we usually assume stuff. Um, yeah. So every amino acid has got the central carbon, which everything else is attached to, which the the NH two group and the CO two group 
um, is attached to, which makes the backbone, and which also the residue, which makes all the interactions, etc., is attached to. And this is the central thing of every amino acid. And when we want to simplify things, this is the one thing every amino acid definitely has, apart from you know the CH2 and, and um, uh, CO2 and, and NH2, um, but this is kind of the center. If we want to simplify things, we only look at the C alpha, therefore we mention this a lot. And if you want to look at the similarity of proteins, we are often also limited to looking at only the positions of the C alphas. Okay, but in this case, <laughs> we decided that looking at the C alphas was not enough, because it doesn't really characterize how this amino acid can interact. But rather than that, we really looked at the, the, the functional groups we find in the binding site. For example, we look at, okay, we have a CO, which is a hydrogen bond acceptor. We have an NH something, which is a hydrogen bond donor. And then every of those groups would be marked as a point in space that has a, a property. And these are the properties of the um, centers. And some functional groups can be a hydrogen bond donor or an acceptor, an OH, for example, can be both. Um, then, <coughs> and if a residue has got several of them, then you just place several of these centers. Um, and then the, um, these properties would be mapped to the surface. So you, you calculate the surface of where how close could an, an interacting atom come and then you map the properties to the surface so you've got lots of surface points somewhere in space. Um, and <coughs> then in order to, to, um, to superimpose two proteins we would take um, these centers here and they would um, make the nodes of a graph. Um, and this graph, the nodes in the graph are connected by edges and every edge is kind of annotated by the distance between the nodes. So you've got a hydrogen bond donor here, you've got a hydrogen acceptor there, these are two nodes in a graph and I have an edge which is annotated with the distance between these two. And for every protein I've got loads of these and these make, make a big graph. So I now have a graph for protein A and a graph for protein B. Um, now, if I want to superimpose these, I want to know which part of graph A can I put on which graph of part B. <coughs> and what I do in order to find that is I make an associated graph. Um, and in the associated graph, I take a node from A, a node from B, um, and compare all of them. And if these two have similar properties, they make a new node. So all the, all the ways I can match my node 1 from protein A onto any node uh, from protein B would make a new node. Okay, then I need to, now I have a new graph with loads and loads of nodes and now I find how they are connected. If they are connected, that means that um, the matching between one thing in A and one thing in B is compatible with the matching of this other um, point in A and this other point in B. Only then I want to have an edge in my associated graph. If the distances are too different, that wouldn't mean that would mean I couldn't superimpose them. Okay, so what I need to do now is to um, compare the distances in A and the distances in B. And if they're compatible, I can make an edge in my associated graph. And this is the, um, the parameters that were used in here. <coughs> so the overall distance had to be um, less than 12 angstrom because if it's more it just gets too much and, and it gets ir irrelevant and the distance different had to be below 2 angstrom. And then I can use some standard uh, computer science algorithms which I don't know much about but we've, which we can just take out of the cupboard <laughs> um, and look for a common subgraph. Um, and if we find the maximal common subgraph, then we have the arrangement of um, pseudocenters that we can superimpose and we've solved our problem. But now we only have a superimpositioning and we might find a load of, lo loads of them and we still need to score which of them is better. 
And for the scoring, we went back to this mapping of uh, features onto the surface. And now we started to compare the surfaces. So we wanted to have that alignment of the two structures where the surface patches would be most similar. And that is um, what's illustrated here. And actually for cases like I showed before, um, they were able to find these dissimilar pockets. And that was when my colleague got his PhD and was very proud. <laughs> Okay, so now I've shown you one example of how to find these dissimilar pockets. Um, but the other thing, the other topic of this uh, lecture was how do we dock? How do we find a ligand that fits into um, a binding site? Um, and in a way, you will discover this is pretty similar to this um, structure alignment thing. Because in one case, we we have the interaction sites we want to um, superimpose. And when we want to put a ligand in there, we just have kind of the, the imprint, which we then also need to somehow align with the, um, with the binding site. So in principle, the, the techniques that we use are pretty similar. And that's just what, what I meant with you. We have a reoccurring theme in here. Um, okay, so when we dock, we need to score, we need to evaluate how well does this um, ligand fit in there. We need to find a position, we need to orient it somehow with respect to the binding site. Uh, I'm going to, to um, show one or two example programs and if there's time I'm going to tell you a bit about the performance of docking programs. Um, Okay, some general ideas of good binders if you ever come into the position of trying to, um, to find a good um, ligand. Um, there are some general rules of uh, thumb. So if you have some lipophilic contacts, that helps. Um, and the reason is that um, uh, if you have water molecules next to a lipophilic surface, then they need to be pretty ordered there. And if you put a ligand in there, which has got a hydrophobic surface next to this other hydrophobic surface, you can free all the ordered water molecules and you gain loads of entropy. And that's always good. Um, the behavior of H-bonds is pretty unpredictable. Um, because if you have uh, um, an OH group in the binding site or you have an OH group on the ligand and they occur in, in watery solution, they're usually pretty satisfied with their solvent. There's water around them and they're happy. Um, so it's pretty hard to say if when, when these two bind together whether that's going to be positive or not. Um, on the other hand, if you bury an OH group next to something where it can't interact anymore, that's definitely negative. Um, yeah, so you shouldn't bury any polar atoms in any um, environments that aren't good for them. The other thing is, if you have a, a ligand that is pretty rigid, so you don't have loads of rotatable bonds, that's again positive, because when this ligand gets bound, it loses freedoms of movement, so it loses entropy, um, and that would be bad. So you want to have something rigid, which doesn't get stuck so much, and then it doesn't make so much of a difference that it binds. <coughs> but you can't always have a rigid ligand. I mean, maybe you can't fit anything in there that's rigid. Um, okay, so for calculating the bound state, um, we have to be um, able to distinguish between likely and unlikely conformations. And um, so, Docking is a, is a many part problem. One thing is we have one ligand where we want to find how it fits into a protein. And then we want to score that and say whether it's a good fit or not. The other thing is we might have loads of ligands um, and we want to find out which of these ligands is going to bind best into my protein. So for every ligand, we have to find a good pose and score that. And then for all the ligands with respect to each other, we have to say which one is better. Because that is what really for a chemist in the end helps. Because then rather than making loads of experiments and trying to bind this, we can do it in the computer and say we limit the experiments to that set. Okay? But it gets increasingly difficult. Finding a pose, scoring a pose, and then comparing different ligands with respect to, to each other gets more and more difficult. Um, 
And in all this, we assume that in the bound state, we have a defined minimum in the first place. Otherwise, we couldn't really predict very well anyway. Um, something people often forget, but which we should keep in mind, is that we don't only have the interaction between the ligand and the protein, but we also, inside the ligand, we also have some forces to, to consider. So um, a ligand, uh, this is what's shown here um, in a very sim uh, simple example. Um, you have a, <coughs> um, a compound with uh, four um, carbons, and um, if the, the bulkiest pieces of this um, compound are right next to each other, you do get some repulsion between them. Um, and then the bigger your, your, your molecule gets, the more difference it makes in energy. Um, so what, pe what docking programs often do is to first work out a good confirmation of the ligand and then dock that. But of course that is not completely correct because a good interaction with the protein might cancel out the, the negative effect of putting things next to each other that wouldn't like to be next to each other. So that's why so the, the, the first docking programs had to start with, I mean it's, it's a huge space you need to explore, so you need to start with something. So the first things always started with the rigid ligand and the defined set of confirmations, but now that the compute power got better and we learned more about how to efficiently search, um, we, we approach this more by building it up and um, so that different terms can cancel each other out. But again, so the important point to remember is don't just think about the protein ligand interaction, you also need to uh, think about the um, conformations or the, the energies within the protein and within the ligand. Within the protein, by the way, something that is still like on the forefront of research because it still makes the, the search space too big. Okay, um, for, ca for characterizing the ligand, we have some typical force fields that calculate that, and usually what we do is to uh, approximate um, the distance between atoms um, by a spring, the angle between atoms by a spring, um, and, also, and the torsions are um, uh, also approximated by a term. So this is this occur this kind of thing occurs in almost every force field, which then calculates an energy. Um, and so there are some force fields that try to so in in um, you don't need to learn all this. This is just to illustrate the what people do in order to try and calculate these energies. You know <laughs> that there are loads of things they try to keep in mind and and loads of parameters they try to optimize. Um, and I just wanted to, to, to um, show a few things to illustrate. So, for example, this is the force field from, from charm, this is the force field from amber, and um, you can see that the, the terms reoccur. So, you've got this, um, this spring for the bonds, you've got the spring for the angles, you've got. Um, now I can't, yeah, the dihedrals and the, the torsions are more or less the same. Um, you see the, um, the Leonard-Jones again, which I introduced earlier. So again, you don't need to, lead, to learn this. It's more like to give you confidence that you've seen that before. So whenever somebody shows you a short of force field, you know, ah, yeah, I know what they're talking about. Um, and but also what you see is that there are loads of parameters. So if you really want to, to calculate an energy somehow, now we know to need to have all these parameters for every type of bond, for every type of angle, etc. We need the parameters. And now there are different ways of deriving these parameters. One is that people try to really start from first principles and, and derive this by physics and uh, make measurements on small molecules and how they, um, they wiggle, etc. And the other way is that um, we say, okay, with all this, we calculate a binding energy. So let's look at how do different ligands bind to different proteins, and then map all these um, binding constants again to all the parameters. So we try to optimize these parameters such that they reproduce the binding of different proteins or different ligands best. So that's a different approach. Um, okay, uh, yeah, 
The, another difference is that these, um, these tools that are so-called empirical scoring functions, um, they try to somehow account for um, entropy. So the physical things, they can't do really anything about the entropy. I, I told you that burying stuff in, in um, uh, hydrophobic environments, etc., might be negative for binding, and it's very hard to, to capture that in a scoring function that is only based on all these torsions and charges, etc. Whereas here, if we parameterize that based on the binding constants anyway, we can put in a term that can capture that in a way. And, and one thing that is done, for example, is to look at the buried surface area, um, hydrophobic surface area, and just have a term for that. Okay. Um, and the final thing, no, I think I'm going to skip over that because it's too much for now. Uh, okay. So now we know there's a way of calculating energies. Um, now let's look at what do we need in order to find how the ligand could fit into the binding site. We have different degrees of freedom. One is the relative position, so we kind of take the center of mass of protein of the protein and the center of mass of the ligand, and we can move it around somewhere. So these are three degrees of freedom. Then we have the relative orientation, uh, and we have all the rotatable bonds in the ligand and all the rotatable bonds in the protein. So that's the just so you have an idea of the space which we need to, to optimize. Um, and. Sorry? The amount of space we have to keep in mind and optimize, and just imagining all different positions it could be, it's a lot. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, Okay, so usually, you know, when, when you have a docking problem, usually you focus on one protein and then usually you know something about it. So what you usually give a docking program is not the whole protein. Mm -hmm. Well, we usually give it, okay, this is the thing, the binding site, and we expect you to stick it in there. So, I mean, otherwise it would be stupid to, to not put in information. And that's also one of the most important things, uh, messages of, of the lecture. If you have information, then you should always put it in and only simulate the stuff you don't know. Um, the only reason why you might not want to do is if you want to, to validate your method and see, okay, does it approximately reproduce the thing in the first place? Okay, so um, what are algorithms for searching all this? Um, there is shape matching. Um, one very old docking program called Doc mainly looks at the um, Van der Waals interactions and, and the general shape. Um, there's um, in, uh, incremental construction. So, um, as I said, you you have you work out the core of your compound, usually the biggest, most rigid part. Um, you work out how that one would fit into the binding site, and then from there you start to expand. And then you can have a search tree and, and look at how you do that. You can have some genetic algorithms, which in a way describe your, the location and the torsions, etc. and then you mix and mingle among that. Um, and you can have simulated annealing, which means you start with some pose and then you start to, to, to optimize the energy and, until you find the minimum. And there's also Monte Carlo. Um, yeah, DOC was, again, one, one of the first um, docking programs. Um, you see it's from um, the 80s, so it's really pretty early. And the basic idea was to represent the active site by a set of spheres, um, and the ligand by a set of spheres, and then we do sphere matching. And that's why I say we come very often back to this general superimpositioning idea. It's like superimpositioning proteins, now we're superimpositioning the pocket with the ligand. Um, yeah, so these are the different parts. Um, and now we have the ligand atoms and the protein spheres, and we look for a distance compatible match of the ligand atoms and the protein spheres, and again we have this matching graph and the cliques, etc. So, same idea as before. Um, 
and Doc has been around for a while and people thought, well, let's not just throw it away and do something completely new, but we also want to make Doc flexible and what they did for that is to, um, as I told you for flex, um, you analyze your, your ligand, you find out what is the, the anchor and then I, um, I place my anchor with all the old docking um, mechanism for dock and then I start growing my anchor um, and then I can have different kinds of scoring functions and that can make it faster or, or slower depending on how intricate that is. Um, so we don't have much time. Um, I think I'll skip over that. Then one thing to, to look at is how do we evaluate docking? Um, so if you want to evaluate a docking program, what you can do is you look at, can I reproduce my experiment? So I have a, a protein structure where a, a ligand is bound, I take it out, I use my docking tool to put it back in, and then I say, look, does the confirmation I have predicted um, fit to the um, confirmation that I really find in the experiment? Um, Another thing is um, I have several ligands which I know bind to the same protein. I dock them, I score them, and then I look just the ranking I find with my predictions correspond in a way to the, to the binding constants I can measure. That's another way of um, evaluating a, a um, docking method. And the last thing is, and that is most relevant for pharma industry, um, do I get an enrichment? So I have a huge database of potential binders, um, and now I, I um, dock and score all these binders, and then I select a subset, like I have thousands, and I select um, a few hundreds, and is the proportion of really active molecules in my subset higher than um, it was, would be if I scored everything. So how much is the enrichment? How much, um, how many of the, the, the really bind, well binding things do I still find back? Because that means if I, if I can prove that my docking methods can select me the most important, the, the most well binding molecules, that means I don't have to make so many experiments anymore. That means I can rely on it and just really um, in the lab test a hundred instead of, I mean in the reality it's um, a factor more, <laughs> but I, I would just test a hundred instead of a thousand. Okay, um, to just give you an idea of, of one example which I, I uh, tried, um, in green would be the, the real um, the experimental pose of the ligand, um, I ducked this thing back and the best result was the yellow one, um, but the thing on the first rank was the blue one. Um, so this is what, what you have pretty often and that is due to the fact that um, out here it's, um, so it's flexible and then it's always, you know, people who optimize docking programs then start to discuss um, actually why is it crystallized like that and could it be just because of crystal interactions and things like that. Okay, um, looking at the docking uh, accuracy, how well um, can, a do can different docking programs reproduce um, the experimental pose? <coughs> um, so, now I have to think because the last time I presented this was a while back. Um, what they did was to, to um, take different docking tools um, and different ways of um, handling the flexibility um, to make that more comparable. But the, the uh, main message is that um, yeah, so some tools were able to redock um, the compound, uh, like 55% of the compounds, um, and the average um, distance of the atoms would be in the between two, uh, 2.5 and 3 angstrom. Um, 
So that was kind of the, the best docking tool in that test that was Guild. And depending on what method you used for, for generating the confirmations, they were able to find a pose for like uh, above 60 or below 60% of the compounds. For the other ones, they wouldn't find a solution. And then if they did find a solution, the, the average of the solution would be like um, 2 angstrom dis to 2.5 angstrom distance from the um, real solution. And there were also some where um, the average deviation would be around 4.5 and they would only find it for 35% of the um, structures. So just to give you an idea of how well this works or doesn't work. Um, yeah, so these were the, the, the top scorers. Um, and then if you said, okay, I don't care for the scoring, whatever solution, at whatever rank I find the solution, um, then the, the picture gets a bit different. Um, they were able to find back something like the um, real, um, real pose. Uh, in like 80% of the cases for the best um, structure and it would be um, a distance between 1 and 1.5 angstrom um, on average. Um, that means the scoring is still a problem. So we find good solutions but we don't necessarily find them at first rank. And now if you have a chemist in, in um, or a computational chemist in a company um, and they help find drugs, what they really do is to look through per molecule at least the top 10 scores and visually analyze that and there seems to be some knowledge that humans can after a while easily learn and we still haven't managed to teach the programs. Um, because they are able to pick out, okay, this is actually really a good pose and I believe that and I'm going to work with that instead of the thing that was scored best by the algorithm. Um, yeah, the, the other thing is how are the correlations with binding affinities? If you take the top score, um, you see the correlation coefficients aren't really big. Um, so what they did is to, to take just the, whatever score you get from this, this um, tool and see how does it correlate with the binding affinity. And the score is not um, extremely high. Uh, let's skip over that one. Um, but still, um, docking tools do help. Um, so one example we often um, site as um, computational chemists is um, tackling HIV and HIV is pretty difficult because it mutates all the time. So once you find a drug that acts against it, it just changes something and then again your drug doesn't bind anymore. Um, and so the idea was to try and find something that acts against the wild type and all and loads of mutations. And therefore people um, docked a library of molecules against wild types and mutants and then tried to find those compounds that bind well with both. Um, and in the end they visually inspected 1500 structures, which is quite a lot. They selected nine and they found three compounds that um, really bound in a micromolar range, which is the level you want to get to when you really want to develop a drug. So, and then they didn't just bind to, to the wild type, but they also bind to mutants in that range. Okay, so I think I'll stop there. And um, yeah, so one thing is, um, do you have any questions? And the other thing is, um, do you want to have uh, exam questions from this? <laughs> uh, there?